Hello and welcome to another episode of Zelf on the Shelf. I am one of your hosts, Samantha Shelley. And I'm Tana Gilliland. Do you know what's funny about that is I was thinking we should do full names today. Uh-huh. And then, but, and then you did. We did. However, we pulled a quick one on you. We switched names. That's an example of a lie. lie. I'm really <laughs> Something we will be discussing at length today. <laughs> so today we'll be discussing the concept of lying for the Lord, a rich tradition in the history of the LDS church. Yeah, it really feels like lying for the Lord is how it's been able to survive this long. Yeah. Like they've relied on it. Oh, it hasn't just been like, a, it's been like, like quite a standard practice that if it hadn't have been there, Who's to say what the church would even be in 2023? Amen. Uh, in fact, playing <laughs> loosey-goosey with the truth actually predates Mormonism. Um, of course, before Joseph Smith ever pulled a religion from his hat, he used to tell gullible farmers he could lead them to ancient burial sites protected by guardian spirits with whom he would perform ritualistic negotiations, i.e. magic, to secure their treasure presumably while others were doing the digging. <laughs> In his defense, I used to tell kids on the playground that my mom was taking us to a theme park that weekend so they would play with me. I just said I had a brother in college who would beat up the bullies. <laughs> I should have said that my dad was God and would burn them alive at the last day. <laughs> you can't beat up. And there's always some reason why the spirits couldn't show up that day or couldn't help. Yeah, uh, the enchantments were always too strong. Uh, the people didn't have enough faith. Suffice it to say, no treasure was ever found, and this led to a series of courtroom appearances where Joseph Smith's reputation as a treasure-digging fraud was forever sealed. It was this bad reputation was the reason that Isaac Hale, Joseph's father-in-law, disapproved of his marriage to his daughter, Emma. So basically, Emma's dad just knew that he was always doing his little schemes. Yep. Didn't want her, his daughter... Being a part of that, no stability. Now, of course, one of Joseph Smith's biggest deceptions was the production of the Book of Mormon, uh, which came from that very seer stone he used to trick the farmers. But uh, we've gone into that plenty in other videos, and we don't have to debunk that now. Suffice it to say, it's riddled with errors, contradictions, and evidences of being a contemporary work from the, produced from the mind of Joseph Smith. And given his access to or uh, the traditional beliefs surrounding the origins of the Native Americans, in his day and time. I'd say that Joseph's biggest stumbling block in terms of honesty came through polygamy. As most people who are interested in this, the subject of Mormonism are aware, Joseph's first polygamous wife, second wife, was Fanny Alger, who Emma witnessed. Ugh. Do you know the story of Fanny Alger? <laughs> well, the, the, what I imagine is true is that she she found them having sex in the barn. They say it was a transaction in the barn, right? Yeah, Emma, yeah, Emma said that she witnessed a transaction in the barn between Joseph and their 16-year-old live-in servant, Fanny Alger. And if it had all been actually above board, well, first of all, he would have got the ceiling power before it happened, that's a big one. But then also, he's supposed to get Emma's permission, right? Before every marriage. Yeah. In Doctrine and Covenants 132, the revelation that officially canonizes the, the principle of polygamy, Joseph Smith gives the explicit command that all wives are, first of all, supposed to be virgins, ick, and second of all, that Emma is supposed to give her consent for each of them, otherwise it's adultery. And uh, we know from all the available historical evidence that Joseph Smith did not follow that uh, his, own, his own commandments in that regard. He took many wives without Emma's knowledge, and many of them were not virgins, of course. Several of them were underage girls, um, but others were already married. <laughs> it's like, why even give that revelation if you already know you've been breaking both those rules a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's like the, the same energy of I'm the least racist person in the world. It's just <laughs> like that same thing of like, you always think that people will be smarter about their lying. Yeah. Uh, the, the Fanny Alger instance is, is probably the most damning right off or right off the bat just shows what a clusterfuck this whole thing is because you have the LDS Church who, on their website, define adultery as um, any unlawful sexual association of men and women. I guess there's a loophole for non-binary people. But it's clear, totally evident, that Joseph Smith was engaged in an unlawful relationship with Fanny Alger. On the first account, it was against anti-bigamy laws um, mm. of the time. It was illegal to have multiple wives in Ohio during Joseph Smith's time. So, one, he's breaking the law. Not a law that I think is just... 
But the law, nonetheless, and a point that the church continually argues is that you ha- it has to be lawfully ordained by, you know, the government has to approve mm-hmm. of relationships in order for them to be valid and sexual. So he broke the law. Not only that, he broke the spiritual law. Mm-hmm. Um, we know from church history that, um, well, I guess I should say Mormons believe that in order for a marriage to be fully binding and sanctified by God, it has to be done through the sealing power. Now, Joseph Smith didn't receive the sealing power until 1837, about three years after his relationship with Fanny, which goes to show, again, that this was totally an illicit affair. And we're not even talking about the possible ethical dilemmas of uh, age and power differentials. Also, when your own, what was Oliver Cowdery, like a counselor, first counselor or mm-hmm. something? When your own first counselor is calling it out as gross. Uh I mean, you have a problem. <laughs> yeah, so this that's actually becomes uh, a problem further down the road with, um, you have the Kirtland Safety Society, which is a bank that Joseph Smith set up saying that he saw it in vision and he promised the members that if they would invest, it would provide for the temporal safety of the saints. But due to situations outside of his control, economic downturns and op- outside opposition, the bank failed, contradicting the revelations that he gave. And a lot of people lost all their money. And so naturally, a lot of people began to uh, doubt the prophetic gift of Joseph Smith, including Oliver Cowdery. And that's when the Fanny Alger story started to circulate among the general (laughs) membership. And Oliver Cowdery called the Fanny Alger affair a dirty, nasty, filthy scrape. Potentially a classic male move, though, to not really care about it and speak up about it until you've lost money. (laughs) (laughs) Until something's affected. It's like, "Mm, that underage girl will let it slide until my money's gone. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, I imagine that there's, you know, at one point they're co-workers working on their little book together. Things start spiraling out of control. He takes more and more excesses. Mm. And uh, becomes less and less um, concerned with other people's opinions. Perhaps Oliver starts giving power to different people. And um, so Oliver Cowdery starts propagating the story of the Fanny Alger incident, which is corroborated by multiple contemporary sources. This isn't something he just pulled out of a hat like the Book of Mormon. Because he refused to back down on the accusation of adultery, Oliver Cowdery was excommunicated from the church becoming the first person to be excommunicated for telling the truth. The first of a long list of people, um, especially in regard to polygamy, which, as I said, becomes the stumbling block uh, of the church and the precedent for lying for the Lord for the next several centuries. Joseph Smith taking wives. Meanwhile, the church publication, The Millennial Star, says... The Latter-day Saints from the rise of the church in 1830 till the year 1843 had no authority to marry any more than one wife each. To have done otherwise would have been a great transgression. Another church on paper, the Times and Seasons, wrote, The law of the land and the rules of the church do not allow one man to have more than one wife alive at once. So, on the one hand, we have Joseph Smith taking multiple wives, Uh, disregarding the laws of the land and his own spiritual admonitions, um, excommunicating those who tell the truth about it, and then publishing a narrative that completely contradicts his private actions. I definitely think, you know, because from Brigham onward, the church was very sort of open about its polygamy, except for that time when they like said they were stopping it, but they didn't actually (laughs) stop it. But you know what I mean? It like became such a like accepted part of Mormonism. I think it's like easy to forget how much when Joseph was alive it was in secret like it's the reason he died it's the reason he got put in prison like do you know what I mean it's like he burns down a printing press for exposing him like everything like came to a head because of his lies about polygamy it wasn't this like Joseph giving sermons about how hard it was it was literally just him being like I'm not doing that like the whole (laughs) the whole time there was never a time where he was like this commandment's being like that was just Brigham onward right yeah and so the average church member was just not aware that this was happening. Right. It was just Joseph Smith having sex with a bunch of people, basically. Uh, which And it is weird because there are a ton of people who know about it and who are affected by it. Right. And it becomes this like public secret where, and if people you know find out about it, or and he also initiates several people into the practice, telling them that if they get caught, he'll punish them, excommunicate them, and then re- invite them back into the fold mm-hmm. on promise that they keep hush hush about it 
Very um, Keith Raniere. You totally. It's so funny watching the uh, Nexium, the cult Nexium's leader, Keith Raniere. You see him doing the exact same stuff that Joseph Smith mm-hmm. did. It's like they followed the same cult leader playbook. It's really incredible. Of course, Joseph had a history, as we said, of proposing to married men's wives. Um, contrary Still to his no own revelation. <laughs> uh, in fact, on multiple occasions, he sent men on missions and then married their wives. Uh, modern apologists refute that, saying, that's a lie. That only happened twice. <laughs> you need to do a skit of, like, Joseph searching on Pornhub, and it's, like, a uh, man proposing to another man's wife. <laughs> <laughs> this particular predilection got him in the biggest trouble of his life in 1844 when he proposed to the wife of his counselor, William Law. Uh, Of course, she refused him, and he then uh, said that she actually proposed to him, and he turned her down. She was ugly and a bitch anyway, so I didn't even care. Totally. (laughs) Of course, uh, as to be expected, William Law didn't appreciate this act of Joseph's proposing to his wife, lying about it, and he brought it up with Joseph. Joseph retaliated by firing him from his position as counselor and then later holding a kangaroo court that went against church protocols and ultimately excommunicated William Law from the church. Again, for just taking issue with the fact that Joseph did something and then lied about it. So then, as the history shows, William Law went on to, um, with several other people who had been thrown under the bus by Joseph Smith, published the Nauvoo Expositor, a paper which chronicled Joseph's uh, extramarital affairs and several of his um, political dealings. Some stuff that, uh, that the government wouldn't be too happy right. about. And, These uh, con men never just have their finger in like one or two pies. It's always just like weirdly <laughs> extensive, like the level of corruption and the, where, where you're like, why don't you just keep it simple? Like just right. do the, have the wives, <laughs> like do that. No. <laughs> Get some money. But no, they always got to be like reaching further and further out and making everything more and more unstable. Uh-huh. And, you know, again, I don't think that the anti-bigamy laws of the time were necessarily just. I'm a polyamorous person. I believe that people should be able to have relationships with whoever they want. Um, But again, the fact that the church is constantly iterating the need to uh, abide by the laws of the land. Yeah. They set themselves up to be hypocrites, which is so weird. And it's just a common uh, LDS response, I feel, to, uh, you know, conversations about Joseph's polygamy to say, like, well, it wasn't illegal back then. And it's like, it was. It was. It totally was. But they obviously, uh, they're focusing on the age thing. It's like, it wasn't illegal. It's like, so is it a problem if it's illegal in a different way? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're like, uh, age of consent laws didn't even exist. And it's like, well, the uh, neural development of children Hasn't was the changed. same 200 years Takes ago as it is now. Like, <laughs> <a> tiny change. <laughs> like, why would that make a difference? Mm. And then when it actually is shown that he was breaking the law, you're just like, mm, turn a blind eye. That's actually different. Some people say, he, well, he had to be quiet about it because otherwise they'd be persecuted. <laughs> and... <laughs> The funny they thing is... They could be loud about their race. Well, actually, yeah, they had to be racist too because then... They would Otherwise, be they'd be persecuted. <laughs> and they were so persecuted, but the persecution just would have been worse. Right. And what's funny reason. is that there were other communities contemporary to the church that were practicing polygamy, like Oneida. And I'm not saying that they practice it well or ethically. I'm just saying that they did openly and didn't receive persecution. The persecution, the likes of like William Law and others, were because Joseph Smith was practicing polygamy Mm -hmm. in secret and predatorily and then lying about it publicly and punishing those who spoke about it spoke out about it that was the beef and that why that's why there was such a strong retaliation what i find interesting is there had to have been people who were alive under joseph smith who heard joseph smith saying i have only one wife who were then alive under brigham and heard brigham say that joseph was practicing polygamy actually Uh uh-huh but at that point, you're just, you know, Cults. down the memory yeah. hall. <laughs> yeah. When um, the public apocalypse doesn't happen, it strengthens your faith. We know that from cult psychology. Absolutely. Um, and it is funny. Uh, shortly after William Law's accusations became public, Joseph Smith confidently declared, What a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery and having seven wives when I can only find one. I am the same man and as innocent as I was 14 years ago, and I can prove them all perjurers. At that time, he had over 30 wives. <laughs> Something that the LDS Church now accepts. And that's a church-approved quote. <laughs> totally. Yeah, this so is like, from the history of the church. There's so much with, again, there's so much within like <laughs> church-approved literature that is like blatantly proves what Joseph was like. 
And you know, what's really funny is that um, the history of the church, this will come back later, but has been scrubbed multiple times uh, under the direction of church leadership in the, histor- in the historical department um, to remove all mm. unsightly evidences, things that don't go with the modern narrative or the mm. modern morality. For instance, they scrubbed the records of... Uh, any reference to Joseph Smith drinking alcohol, something he did throughout his life, including on the day he died in Carthage jail. And they also... Just uh, so pathetic that they would scrub that. Yeah. I'm like, that's the least of your concerns. But it's like, even that is so threatening. So yeah, Joseph gets caught lying. Uh, he burns down the printing press that tells the tr- that's telling the truth about his extramarital affairs. And the government obviously takes issue with, <laughs> with a... A public leader, because he's not only the president of the church, he's also the mayor of Nauvoo, showing how much he, how little he cares for the separation of church and state. Declaring himself the king yep. of the world. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just little things here and there. Yeah, the government didn't like him burning down a printing press for having opinions he didn't like or for re- revealing history that he didn't want revealed. He gets sent to Carthage, where he's ultimately killed. No, he was uh, he was killed and persecuted because his testimony of Jesus Christ was too powerful and bold and brave. Yeah, that's it. You know, it's funny you were talking about how this is this whole thing is like central to the Joseph Smith story. Uh, so many of the interpersonal and political dynamics that are playing out throughout the history of the church, all leading up to his death and or martyrdom. <laughs> And what's so interesting is that none of this gets any airtime in official church representations. If you watch the church's publication, Joseph Smith, Prophet of the Restoration, there's not a single reference to any of any of Joseph's other wives. Which, like, again, if you've got nothing to hide and it really is all fine and sanctioned by God, why not tell people? Yeah. (laughs) Why not? It's like, no, they were just lying about Joseph and that's why he got killed. And it's also, you know, on a slightly different note, the church claims to that men and women are equal and that women are just as important as men. They just have their place, you know, separate but equal. And if that were the case, if women actually mattered... Why wouldn't they get a mention? Mm-hmm. Can did you ever hear the names of of Joseph Smith's other wives growing up in the church? And here's the thing that is like easy to forget when you're like just mired in the sexist thinking. Like for those for every like one of Joseph's polygamous wives, like that's her only husband. This mm-hmm. is her marriage. You know, it's being split 30 ways or like maybe not even, you might not even get a 30th of him, mm-hmm. you know. But it's interesting that for some he claims sexual exclusivity, like with 14-year-old Helen Mark Kimball, who thereafter wasn't allowed to even attend dances with youth her age. Um, but then other women uh, report that, uh, in fact, one of Joseph Smith's wives remarked to one of Brigham Young's wives that how much she... Uh, how the most the most difficult trial of her life was having to be dishonest to her husband uh, because she would receive Joseph Smith's affection whenever he felt like calling on her. Mm-hmm. So feeling like she had to be dishonest in behalf of Joseph Smith to her husband so was such a huge trial. Joseph wasn't like putting an end to these women's current marriages all the time. Not all the time, no. Which, again, just goes to show, you know, like how much it was a culture of secrecy and, you know, you can't have the men know because they're probably like leaders in the church or like involved in the church. Mm -hmm. Except for some who get initiated into the practice. Right. Polygamy obviously doesn't go away with the death of Joseph Smith. It only becomes more open after... Comes back harder, faster, stronger, (laughs) Uh younger. (laughs) Yeah. When Brigham Young leads the saints to Utah, he begins, they begin openly practicing polygamy, which goes against, again, the laws of the United States. No one else could have led the saints to Utah. No, nobody. (laughs) No one else could have come up with a grid system. I don't have to go into all the history, but polygamy becomes the central issue in tensions between the blossoming state of Utah, formerly known as the Territory of Deseret, and the United States government. They pass a series of uh, legislations, most notably the Edmunds-Tucker Act, which allows the federal government to seize all assets of the church. Mm. And um, many Mormon leaders, including the president of the church, go into hiding. Um, and this is when lying for the Lord becomes like a very uh, prominent principle in the church. Um, and I, I, you know, I want to be complex about this. You have this group of people who's 
trying to practice their religion, and they are doing the best that they can to prove in court that polygamy is central to their religion so that they can say, you can't stop us from doing this because that's infringement of religion. Polygamy is a central doctrine. We need it. Without polygamy, Mormonism doesn't exist. And we have so many testaments of uh, various prophets and apostles attesting to such, again, in court. Also tough because it's like the reasons... The reasons the government didn't want them doing polygamy is not for the reasons they should actually care, you know, like mm-hmm. women and children being coerced. Right. It's just like this, you know, the Christian idea of like one one partner only. Mm-hmm. And well, I you know some of the uh, they called polygamy one of the twin relics of barbarism, and people who came to Utah and reported on it um, definitely gave some insight into that thing. Salt Lake was seen as essentially a sex trafficking hub Mm -hmm. where men would go on missions and recruit these young, beautiful women under the pretense of being the one true religion. Meanwhile, they were just trying to recruit wives and then they bring them back after having, you know, given up all their money and possessions and their families and friends uh, Mm -hmm. to hike across the United States. They arrive in Salt Lake only to find that they're being auctioned off to the person with the most keys who has first claim over uh, these women. And they don't have any money. They don't have any connections. They're not going to just like walk back alone across the United States. So they're kind of trapped in Utah in these patriarchal systems. And, you know, the people who in Washington were looking at this are like, yeah, this is bad. We need to clamp down on this. And did, did the women who, you know, are coming in from England or whatever, did they even know that polygamy was happening? Uh, for the most part, no. Oh. It, was, it was still, you know... Milk before meat, or as I like to say, bait before switch. <laughs> it's like ne- that's next level cult stuff because back then, you know, you, you can't get a flight. It's like such a long journey, and then you are literally stuck there right. in like the truest sense. Like you might as well be locked in like a Scientology room of torture. Yeah, it's the absolutely. Same, same level of access to escape. Yeah, there's no way you're going to survive alone going across the plains. No. So you're just like. In the middle of the desert. And then you might be, oh, just thinking about people like on the pioneer trek, just being like, why the fuck did I do this? Mm. Like just realizing there's got to be some people who realize they've been bamboozled or. This is the subject of the book, Wife Number Nine, written by one of Brigham Young's wife, Mm. who was like, yeah, we were totally trafficked into this. So in order to protect members of the church, leadership of the church from being imprisoned, losing all their assets, Mm. people have to just begin lying about the whereabouts of church leaders, about any information that could be compromising. And then uh, the church leadership also lies about how much they are practicing uh, polygamous marriages in the temple, authorizing those marriages. Several presidents after uh, Brigham Young, we have John Taylor, who for most of his presidency was in hiding from the federal government, uh, which is interesting. Imagine having a, a prophet who just like, you don't know where he is, yeah. you don't know what's going on, he's just hiding out, running away from the most feds. Most of his presidency. Uh-huh. And uh, in 1886, <clears throat> he penned by his own hand a direct revelation Uh, In regard to polygamy, which he says, speaking for the Lord, I have not revoked this law, nor will I, for it is everlasting. And those who will enter into my glory must obey the conditions thereof. Even so, amen. Mm. So this is just one of many revelations in Mormonism where the Lord says, this is the way it is. It's never going to change. And then it changes Mm -hmm. because his net, his successor, Wilford Woodruff, um, in order to, quote, provide for the temporal safety of the church, um, issues the official declaration number one, the manifesto, which on paper bans the practice of polygamy in the church. Now, the church kept practicing polygamy, and uh, it's, it's easy to see why there is some confusion and gray area here, because, again, they have a bunch of revelations, a bunch of statements in church, a bunch of testimonies in Congress about how polygamy is so important and it's never going to go away and we have to do it. And if it ever goes away, you can be certain that the church has fallen into apostasy because Mormonism equals polygamy. Now you have the church president saying... Uh, we don't, we don't do polygamy any, anymore. Mm-hmm. We need to keep our assets. And for a lot of people, that was just like, mm-hmm, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. We don't practice polygamy anymore. And they kept performing polygamous marriages in the temple. Mm-hmm. This came to a head in uh, 
and became such a problem that in 1904, then-President Joseph F. Smith issued a second manifesto wherein he officially ended the practice of polygamy. That was the real one. Again. (laughs) That was, like, actually when it stopped. Yeah. And um, even at that time, you still had apostles from the good old days who were like, no, the Lord said by his own voice that this would never change. So they kept doing it, and um, one of those apostles was Matthias Cowley, who was brought in before the Council of the Twelve on charges of performing unauthorized marriages. He said, I am not dishonest and not a liar and have always been true to the work and to the brethren. We have always been taught that when the brethren were in a tight place, that it would not be amiss to lie to help them out. We've always been taught, yeah. (laughs) He also testified that he heard a member of the First Presidency say he would lie like hell to help the brethren. So he's like, hey, man, I'm just doing what you told me to do. I didn't have time to go through the records, but... um, This all becomes so much more convoluted during the Reed Smoot hearings. We've done an article. Did we do a video? video. We did a video. Mm -hmm. Cool. We'll link to the video of the Reed Smoot hearings. I don't know how much we go uh, specifically into the lies surrounding polygamy, but there is so much there. It's such a Mm -hmm. clusterfuck in the history of the Mormon church where they're just like caught with their pants down in so many contradictions and errors. And you have the prophet saying like, well, I'm not really a prophet. They sustain me as such, but I, you know, I haven't had any revelations and I don't claim any of that stuff. Mm. Um, but some of that was lies surrounding the practice of polygamy. Um, but again, this is, this totally sets the tone for the next century about the church's relationship to truth, that it is okay to outright lie It's okay to conceal information if you believe that it's in your best interest or the Lord's best interest Mm. or, you know, the church's best interest. Mm. And since then, we've had just countless examples of the church playing loosey-goosey with the church, with the truth. Um, In fact, in regard to polygamy, we have people like Gordon B. Hinckley, who on on air with... um, was it Larry King or Mike mm-hmm. Wallace said, we don't, we don't believe in polygamy. It's not, it's not doctrinal. And it's like, whoa, that's crazy because 150 years ago, your church was lobbying Congress to convince them that polygamy was central to the practice of, mm-hmm. um, of the church. And even in like private church settings, the leaders are saying like, this will never go away. And if it does, the church is in a positive. Yes. And you have sitting members of the Council of the Twelve Apostles who are sealed to more than one woman. Dallin H. Oaks, Russell M. Nelson, now president of the church, is sealed to two different women. So even if they don't practice polygamy in the sense of like being married to two women at the same time, they still believe that it is a principle that will carry out in heaven. Because women whose husbands die aren't allowed to be sealed to multiple men. No. And so, you know, that's just an example of the way that, that the church, if not outright lying, has no problem dancing around the truth in order to give a false impression to journalists. Uh, Another example of lying to journalists is Jeffrey R. Holland, who, when confronted by a a BBC reporter who asked him about the temple temple penalties, he was like, this was around the time Mitt Romney was running for office. And he said, is it true that, uh, you know, the temple has these gruesome penalties where you have promised to slit your throat or disembowel yourself or be disemboweled if you reveal the proceedings of the temple? And Jeffrey goes, that's not true. That's not true. We don't have temple penalties. And but he's they like, still had them at that time. And he's like, but you did. So Mitt Romney would have promised that his throat would be slit if he talked about the temple. And he goes, nope, 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 that's not true. And it's like... You'd it, expect him to have like a better lie locked in like, <laughs> like some kind of better justification. Uh-huh. Well, you can see the way that like they're just not used to being mm-hmm. called out. They, they're surrounded constantly by yes men who are just constantly buying into everything they can say. Mm-hmm. And when pressed by someone who has the facts... Their just knee-jerk reaction is to yeah. be like, no, that's a lie. And then they see how they get painted into a corner. Which is kind of a lot of, like, that is a very human thing for, your, for denial to be your first reaction. A perfect example of this is in the 90s. Uh, are y'all familiar with the September 6th? So in the 90s, the church excommunicated six uh, high-profile intellectuals who were publishing opinions that 
the church didn't like, one of whom was D. My- historian D. Michael Quinn, who had been a professor at BYU and was a very respected, notable historian who found a bunch of documents and published them. And the church was like, nah, rah, 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 you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> like, this goes against our whitewash sanitized history. Mm-hmm. And they had a big problem, so he ended up getting excommunicated. Boyd K. Packer told him in a meeting that his problem with historians was that they idolized the truth. (laughs) So anyway, Boyd K. Packer, the villain of this era, um, went against church protocol and met with the stake president of Paul Toscano, who we've met, and um, told the stake president that he needed to excommunicate Paul Toscano. And again, this goes against church protocol. Then Steve Benson, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning editorial cartoonist, went and met with Elder Oates or talked to him on the phone and recorded the conversation. And Oates covered for for Packer saying like, oh, or actually he he said that, yeah, Packer did that. It's against church protocol. I'm worried that the church is going to get sued over this because this isn't how things are supposed to happen. And then later in an interview with the press, uh, Elder Oak said, oh, I have no awareness of this happening. Uh, if this happened, uh, it's probably just a mis- miscommunication and the, mis- the stake president misunderstood. Mm-hmm. And, and then Steve Benson was like, um, excuse me, I have you on record saying that you knew about it. That what he did was wrong, and now you're saying, oh, I, I don't know, oh, how could you possibly know? <laughs> and then that became a, a huge scandal, and, and Oaks' defense was, oh, you know, sometimes you just, you're speaking a mile a minute, and you say things, and you don't, you don't mean for them to come out exactly the way that they do. It's like, you don't speak a mile a minute. <laughs> so slowly. But then he never corrected mm. the record. He just went on denying that those things had taken place. And this is sort of a precedent for Elder Oaks, who, by the way, was a Supreme Court justice in Utah and knows what, you know, (laughs) I think that should should say something about his relationship to integrity and honesty. But here we are. Another instance is when um, while while Dallin H. Oaks was a president of BYU, he oversaw a. a gay conversion treatment involving electroshock therapy that involved some like 13 to 16 different gay people and mm. and and was demonstrated to be both ineffective and harmful to the participants they walked away traumatized from the yeah. experience and then when uh, later when elder oaks was called out on it publicly he was like that's all a lie that never happened uh, that was that was all ended before i took took before my tenure as president. A former Supreme Court Justice, Utah Supreme I can't, I can't, I can't. Straight up perjured himself. Yep. I mean, he wasn't, you know, didn't have his hand on the Bible, but he said it was a lie. When we have actual receipts, we've got his name, we've got his email address in the BBC, you know, uh, or in the, the, the CC'd. Mm. We've got... Um, also, can I just say the idea that, like, leaders of a multi-billion dollar global religion... The idea that they just run their mouths sometimes is also not acceptable, even though right. it, they obviously are lying. But it's like the fact that Jeffrey R. Holland wasn't able to pause in that moment in that interview and be like, what's the truth or what's like, I don't know. It's just it's not it's not OK that they're like that disconnected and they're just allowing like their like most basic like lizard brain like things yeah. to... Maybe not lizard brain. I'm not sure. A child like but, exactly yeah. like you it's described. Very, it's very like seeing when a child lies and then <laughs> has to like pivot and say and just something keep else. Doubling down when it's like we are seeing the evidence. It's right here. Uh, and again, I true. I totally understand being in front of a camera or being put on the spot, needing to speak extemporaneously, and not always contextualizing what you want to say in the perfect way you want to say it. And sometimes not having all the facts perfectly represented or um, information that you may not have been aware of. And there are times when people correct us, and usually our response is, thank you for the information. We'll integrate that in the future. (laughs) But to just be like, no, 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 no. I couldn't possibly have said anything dishonest while giving public lectures on the importance of honesty, on giving the facts, on not misrepresenting the details in order to have a favorable outcome, which Mm -hmm. Oaks has done repeatedly, Mm -hmm. and the church itself has done repeatedly. Didn't Joseph Smith... So I only have heard this through people, but didn't he say that thing of like that which you protest the loud the loudest is like the thing you're guilty of? 
Um, I don't know about that. I don't mm. know if that came from Joseph. It sounds a little too complex. For it does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another instance of our our guy, Jeffrey R. Holland, recently was caught in a lie about the staggering growth of the church and how that's the staggering. biggest problem that the church has. And he, says, he cited specific numbers saying that, like, oh, just this week, uh, 16 new stakes have been created. And this is my so menace, how it goes every week. And then you look at the actual records, and it's like, oh, no, that's not happening at all. In fact, the church is closing down stakes. And it's like, why do you got to even do that? Like, yeah, why, just ignore it. Why? <laughs> that's the thing. It's like they built their, uh, their house on such a bullshit foundation where it's like you don't even just claim that, like, the, it's, the church is only for the very elect. And so a lot of people aren't going to get it. And a lot of people are gonna, don't claim that it's going to keep. But then it's like you have your foundational guys saying it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you kind of do have to stick by it. But then it's weird the stuff they choose to stand by versus don't. Because I'm like, this is one that's going to obviously catch you out. Mm. But then there's like other stuff that they said in the past that they just act like they he never said it. So I'm like, mm. act like that never said. <laughs> and then don't, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> like it just blows my mind that they don't even do a good job at lying or like have any kind of strategy. It's just like so knee jerk, so juvenile. And it's funny, in that video, you can see him like, almost catching himself in it because he's like growth of the church is the biggest problem we have uh we created 15 this this week and that's how it's going uh i, I mean my, uh, more or less my so menace uh that's pretty much how it's going like you can see him being like mm -hmm. but then just doubling down rather than like mm -hmm. trying to align his statements with the facts yeah because he knows that like he's speaking to a bunch of people who are like who don't care what he says. They're just so happy to be in the presence of an mm -hmm. apostle. Someone who they have been conditioned to believe is in regular communication, face-to-face -face communication with Jesus Christ. Though when you look at the private records of presidents of the church, like Joseph Fielding Smith, who said, I've never had a vision, I've never seen Jesus. I just had the Holy Ghost come upon me and reveal the truth of Jesus, and that's how I know. And it's like, oh, so your apostolic witness isn't any different than any member of the church or any Christian or any person who has had a strong feeling that their religion is true. That's and so yet you, le you allow people to generate this uh, pedestalized belief about you that you're privy to experiences that they're not even allowed to discuss. Yeah. Yeah, but it's somehow different. It's different. It's, <laughs> more, it's more sparkly. It's got a little sheen on it. You wouldn't get it. <laughs> and these may seem like trivial examples, but they're not. They show how, how this uh, framework operates in the LDS church that like the facts don't really matter. What matters mm -hmm. is our authority and you just believe everything we say. Um, going then, there's just never been a time when they're not lying, but uh -huh. there's also, they've always had, I don't know when they started doing the temple recommend questions, but they're asking every member, are you honest? Yep. And they're and not dealings with your fellow and men. I do think like honesty should be a cornerstone of any kind of valuable spiritual framework, you know, mm -hmm. at least honesty with yourself. Or, yeah, and even if you can't, like, I don't pretend to be 100% honest. Mm, right. I tell little white lies sometimes. Yeah. I, like, again, don't always have all the facts. Um, and I try to communicate my perspective as best as I understand the facts. That doesn't mean I always do so perfectly mm -hmm. or, you know. That being said, I, I hold truth as a, yeah. an aspirational principle. And I'm always trying to be more and more honest even when, you know, being honest in conversation and relationships may be difficult, it's always better than yeah, that's the being thing. dishonest. It's like once you can just acknowledge that honesty is kind of something you have to have as a value and aspire to and like when you know to... Because it is true that sometimes you've lied before your brain's even like caught up with it. Totally. <laughs> that childlike response. Yeah. And so you do... It is something you have to like kind of think about throughout your life. And mm. it, it, I guess honesty is sort of a skill in a way because I mean, in the same way that sort of vulnerability is a skill. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you have to learn to feel safe. Yes. And again, that is something that we have tried to practice on this very channel. Um, I recently had a conversation with a Desnap person where I made this <clears throat> statement and he was like, you've misrepresented this fact. And I, looking back, I was like, you're right, I kind of did. So I said, mm -hmm. hey, I'm sorry that I said this thing. It was not factually correct. The point I was making was this, and I do believe that the point is still valid. Mm -hmm. 
And the Desnat person actually walked away was being like, whoa, I never expected you to apologize. That was really nice. And we ended up having a good conversation. And how much more respect I would have for these men if rather than maintaining this veneer of perfection and being like, we are the, the truth tellers and we have the full knowledge and we only deal in truth and then being caught in lies and just denying mm. it, if they were to say, hey, we made a mistake, I would have so much more mm. respect for them. And even, there's even, just like, what, even if Jeffrey R. Holland had, when asked about Mitt Romney doing the death oaths, it, even if he would have said, yes, that is something uh, that, that he would have done, but th- there's really a lot of context. Like, it's not really... Po- like, if he would have just obscured it somehow, uh-huh. <laughs> I would have even respected that more. You know, like, it's too sacred to talk about, and, like, you're, he made some comment about to the interviewer, like, you're not, like, accurately characterizing what it is. Even something like that <laughs> would have been so much more palatable instead of just a note nope. didn't happen. <laughs> There's just no attempt to even... Which, like, well, I guess, is it even a guilty conscience at that point? I feel like it's just, like, a, a split in, like, your cult identity mm-hmm. and, and the, what's the, you know, the straggled remains of what's left outside of that, which is, like, basically nothing at that point. Mm. Joseph Fielding Smith, sorry, just <clears throat> going with whatever pops in my head at this point. Joseph Fielding Smith had, uh, he was a church historian and was kind of was president of the church at the time when the church was developing a more corporatized structure and the effects of correlation where the church is trying to develop a single cohesive narrative for all the things the doctrines and practices and weed out all the heretical beliefs of former prophets who spoke in behalf of the lord um he was such a a, uh, truth barrier. In fact, when he discovered as a historian the, uh, a first-hand account, a first vision account written in the hand of Joseph Smith and Joseph Smith's diary that contradicted the official narrative of the church, Joseph Fielding Smith ripped it out of the book and kept it in his personal safe so that nobody would see it. Um, later the, the history of the church was edited to remove instances of polygamy, reaffirming the sort of perspective that the RLDS church had maintained up until that point that Joseph Smith had never practiced polygamy, that that was an invention by Brigham Young. And he drove that home hard and which is just so interesting that again, the, the central facet of Mormonism that had been for so long to just be like, nope. Never Mm -hmm. happened, and you don't see any references to polygamy on Temple Square, the church headquarters. You don't see it in the church movies. Mm -hmm. Um, What are some other things he said? He's the one who was famous for prophesying that men would never go to the moon, Mm -hmm. um, which I don't know if you can count that as a lie or just a failed prophecy, but silly Mm -hmm. nonetheless. Um, I brought him up for a specific thing. Didn't he say the the Seer Stone was an anti-Mormon lie as well? Yes, uh, that's exactly what I was looking for. He said that the Seer Stone... Yeah. <laughs> which, he, which he had access to. And, yeah, it was and in knew, the yeah. church vault. <laughs> yeah. Said that that was an anti-Mormon lie, essentially. Which is why I, as an 11-year-old in middle school, when a kid came up to me and said, Hey, South Park talked about your church and how Joseph Smith uh, made the Book of Mormon from looking at a stone in a hat. And I was like, you're a liar. That's not what happened. Because my whole life... I was taught that Joseph Smith used the, the Urim and Thummim to translate the, the gold plate that he no was just sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, like, that's another one where I'm just like, either way, it's completely batshit. Like, why bother? Just like, tell the truth. Like, that's, it's the same either way. Right. Like, but again, it's so it's, ridiculous for it to be a stone and not this ancient set mm-hmm. of glasses. Yeah. Um, turns out Joseph Smith didn't even have the gold plates in his presence for most of the translation process, and then he did it through the rock and the hat, which he had also used to trick farmers. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, yeah, that's why it matters, because, like, the non-existent gold plates, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so Im- imagine my chagrin when, years later, I watched the episode of South Park knowing what I know now that Joseph Smith used the seer in the hat and just being like... Damn, they really did lie to me. They totally misconstrued the information in order for me to believe a traditional narrative that went against the facts. There's endless examples of times when we we know they're lying. Like I think they, they try and take the royal family approach of like just don't address it and then the members just won't like look at anything that's critical. And so, you know, half of them don't even know that like Jeffrey R. Holland blatantly lied on the BBC or any of that because they mm. just stay in their little bubble. And it kind of is an effective strategy. It's just like not not touch it in any way. Mm. 
just lie openly, move on. Move on, yep. But it's like, I, I think, uh, I imagine like it's sort of an apologist idea is that that you know they're kind of doing their best they don't always know everything but it's like it's not just like these misspeaks it's just mm-hmm. like openly lying time and time again and there's like full evidence that they knew they were lying and there's never, yeah there's never consequences so yeah. it's like mm, yeah what do you do they've got their second anointing's been uh they've had it <laughs> they've done, they've done that. <laughs> right which uh is an important point because the second anointing excuses them of all guilt they yep. the judgment day has been moved forward and they can commit any sin mm. short of denying the holy ghost which for some reason takes precedence over like child abuse but pretty typical for a church founded by someone who married several children um which by the way if you're like at the top of the lds church you're jeffrey r holland like how many sins do you really have like the capacity to commit like lying's the big one mm-hmm. like that's the but but it doesn't matter right like realistically you're not Jeffrey Arhan's not going to like get on a dating app with you and his wife or like nothing, nothing. He's not going to, I guess he could like drink coffee or something. I don't know. But it's like, you're in such a bubble at that point that you're just not going to commit any real sins. Well, like the, the things that, you know, mm. are generally people are kicked out for or punished for. Um, and when they do, they're absolved of guilt. Yeah, it's no biggie. Uh, we talked about this on a recent episode, but, um, when the, uh, church attorney was caught soliciting sex and was excommunicated at the excommunication fireside boyd k packer said this will not have any eternal consequences because of course the high up church attorneys and accountants have their calling election mm-hmm. sure so that they can be theocratically justified in lying because Wait, it's not a sin uh-huh. So you can be excommunicated after your second anointing. Right, but you, you'll still you're go still to You're still in the celestial kingdom, kingdom which yeah. is objectively better than membership in the earthly church. <laughs> uh-huh. So, like, it's not even... Well, I guess you can't pray or, like, be a leader anymore. Or, yeah. It's just and a show, though. the same goes with uh, an apostle, Lyman White, was excommunicated in the, ni- I think, early to mid-1900s and for taking a spiritual wife. Mm. And it was the same kind of thing. It's like, well, he has had a calling election made sure. He can't be an apostle anymore, but he's in. <laughs> Everyone takes a little spiritual wife sometimes. Yeah. Um, on the subject of hiding church finances and lying in that regard, um, I saw a clip today of President Monson, who, when visiting Africa, was asked how the church was so rich and could afford to build these colossal castles in Africa. And he said, we're not rich. We just follow the, the law of tithing. And that's something that other leaders of the church have reiterated. We're not rich. We just do tithing. And it's like, you also have a very robust investment portfolio and a uh, investment team that has cr- uh, illegally created several shell corporations to hide church assets. This was before it was public knowledge that the church had hundreds of billions of dollars to its name. And also, why are you trying to hide the fact that you're rich? Like, just own it. It's like, <laughs> it's so off- like that's so easily provable <laughs> that you are rich. They just dig themselves into all these stupid holes. Oh, did you see the um, church accountant guy at conference? Just like, he didn't even mention the SED. See things oh, just like the not. church has been great in all its dealings financially. Nailed it. We really nailed it this year. Yep, like Nelson announcing, like we uh, we condemn abuse in all its forms. While the church Ooh. is midway through legislating and uh, you know fighting a legal battle in Arizona that would prevent them from reporting child sexual abu- sexual abuse to the police, which is the same issue that the Catholic Church was busted for in the spotlight. Mm-hmm. Uh, articles um, whose authors were the same ones who whistle blew about the LDS church for mm-hmm. practicing the same things. So, and they, you know, that there's other instances of that as well, where they, they argued in, in regard to this case mm-hmm. in Arizona, where they said the reason that bishops didn't report this is because we weren't, they weren't supposed to by law while also fighting to make sure that they didn't have to report it by law. Mm-hmm. Just that, it's just endless, two-facedness. It? it is it's just like an endless, endless ball of tangled yarn. That where doesn't... you know, for a church that claims to believe in objective truth, and Nelson recently said, um, emphasize the importance of objective truth. And objective objective more... truth, conditional love. It's simple. <laughs> just remember those. There's two no things. such thing as relative truth or relative <laughs> love. Big words from an organization that is constantly meddling in half truths and outright lies. Yep. So, what did we learn from today's episode? Oh, they just, they're liars. They've always been liars. You could really sum up, like, why people 
leave with because they're constantly lying because that's really what it all comes back to and then they apologists try and do the thing of like you know that that obscure fact was in the friend one time so therefore it wasn't a lie <laughs> yeah in the 60s they mentioned the seer stone yeah. so the church saying that that was an anti-mormon lie wasn't that actually a lie <laughs> <laughs> yeah just you can never you can never pin them on anything, anything. doesn't <laughs> Yeah. They're like, see, from this point of view, it is relatively true. <laughs> it also kind of just shows how much, like, these high control groups don't, uh, especially thinking about early Mormonism, like, they they don't have, like, the hindsight that we have, like, looking back on them, because they don't, Joseph didn't know what the church was going to become, uh, like, after his death or anything. So he's just, like, flying by the seat of his pants and, like, he's just kind of saying what he needs to say to survive in that moment. And they're all just always saying what they don't have any kind of real strategy. I mean, they have the PR team now, which does like keep them somewhat in check, but they still just lie through their teeth constantly. And the PR team also as well. And the PR team supports the lying <laughs> machine, you know? Uh, yeah. Because again, their sole job is to make sure that the church has a positive front when facing the public mm-hmm. on public issues and not necessarily with the objective truth of the situation. Moral of the story is... Just not true. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I'm so tired on this video. It doesn't, like, uh, enthuse me much to talk about, but it is important to talk about. Because it's just, the lying is, like, so blatant. It's at every imaginable size of lie. Yes. It's throughout the entire history of the church. It has, like, every degree of Including the way that we relate to the history of the church. Exactly. (laughs) It's complete bullshit. Lies to cover up former lies. Yeah, it's just, it really is lies all the way down. Because it's, I mean, it was founded on a lie. It's exactly what you would expect if the whole thing were a lie. (laughs) It's just mind-blowing how much these groups... It's like they lie so much, but they're so bad about it. Because they, they don't have to be good liars, because they literally just rely on the fact that when humans... Uh, when their perceived identity is wrapped up in a high control group, they will just deny anything critical. They will just deny any evidence. So that's keeping everything running. It's just that impulse we all have to lie to ourselves. Before you accept the lies of groups like this, you lie to yourself, and you but you might not even know that you're doing it. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Such a shit one. <laughs> well, try not to lie. Let's all try and be really honest this week. And if you can't help it, at least be funny. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's a really good practice to um, just thinking about honesty as a value, not only through the lens of like it's moral to just tell people the truth, but like for yourself to move through life being really honest with uh, like noticing if, if you kind of do an exercise where for a week you really try not to be to lie in any capacity, you really realize the ways that you sort of like self betray or like people please to mm. try and like be accepted and be loved. And a lot of the time it's things where you know, maybe telling the truth would be mildly uncomfortable. But I'm not. Mm. I'm not talking about like if like your friend looks bad, and you know, right, I'm right. talking about things like slightly up from that. But there's just so many ways that we uh, create a false reality that we then have to maintain, which is then like draining. Totally. I had a whole mushroom trip on this mm. <laughs> once, where I just saw all the ways that even little untruths created this like paradigm that yeah. required so much energy to maintain that was sapping yeah. my very life force and uh, you know I, I've I don't think I've ever had like a predilection for I should I I'll be honest I actually have it as a kid I was a total con artist <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know as, as a lot of kids uh you know learn to distinguish mm-hmm. between fiction and reality and uh take more responsibility for being truth tellers I definitely had times where I would Mm-hmm. you know, tell things to kids on the playground that weren't true like all kids do. But, you know, and, and learning and, and growing and trying to be a moral person. Which the church, inc- like, on it, I'm sure that part of why you were so, like, rigid, you know, obsessed with honesty as you grew up was because the church was telling you you had to be honest. It's mm-hmm. the classic thing of, like, one rule for the leaders, a different one for the members. Also, it's advantageous for the leaders of these groups to tell the members to all be really, really, really honest and confess everything you do and like overshare Mm. to like these random people. So you've got this population of people, sorry, that will be like fully honest with you and you can be completely dishonest back, creating that like mirror thing. I don't even have it in me to do like a metaphor or a lesson right (laughs) now. I'm just like, it's so annoying. Meanwhile, I have to hear the voice of Logos in my brain shouting at me for six hours. You must be honest. You must be honest at the memory that I uh, checked out a, uh, item of produce as just 
like regular broccoli when it was secretly organic and I was like yeah. tormented and wrecked by my brain for having been dishonest in that way. Mm. Meanwhile, you know, billion dollar organizations are creating shell corporations and not telling the members for fear that the truth would stop them from paying into the system. <laughs> uh, it's such a shit way to live to just be have to be so scared of the truth constantly. That's my final thought, I think. All right, let's try to. Let's you know try to who do it. knows a little something about lying is drug addicted Mormon teen Stephanie in the eighties. <laughs> We're reading her story on our Patreon right now. It's by author Jack Wayland, who wrote the book Charlie. If you want to support this channel and join us for a funner time than this episode has been, go there. We promise we'll only use it for great things. Fun we drinks. Won't even create a shell corporation to hide our assets for it. Because we we wouldn't know how. We're too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have it in us.